The Battle of Jutland German, the Battle of Skagerrak was a naval battle fought between Britain's Royal Navy Grand Fleet, under Admiral Sir John Jellicoe, and the Imperial German Navy's High Seas Fleet, under Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer, during the First World War. The battle unfolded in extensive manoeuvring and three main engagements the battlecruiser action, the fleet action and the night action, from 31 May to 1 June 1916, off the North Sea coast of Denmark's Jutland Peninsula. It was the largest naval battle and the only full-scale clash of battleships in that war. Jutland was the third fleet action between steel battleships, following the long-range gunnery duel at the Yellow Sea 1904 and the decisive Battle of Tsushima in 1905, during the Russo-Japanese War. Jutland was the last major battle in world history fought primarily by battleships. Germany's high seas fleet intended to lure out, trap, and destroy a portion of the Grand Fleet, as the German naval force was insufficient to openly engage the entire British fleet. This formed part of a larger strategy to break the British blockade of Germany and to allow German naval vessels access to the Atlantic. Meanwhile, Great Britain's Royal Navy pursued a strategy of engaging and destroying the high seas fleet, thereby keeping German naval forces contained and away from Britain and her shipping lanes. The Germans planned to use Vice Admiral Franz Hipper's fast scouting group of five modern battle cruisers to lure Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty's battlecruiser squadrons into the path of the main German fleet. They stationed submarines in advance across the likely routes of the British ships. However, the British learned from signal intercepts that a major fleet operation was likely, so on 30 May Jellicoe sailed with the Grand Fleet to rendezvous with Beatty, passing over the locations of the German submarine picket lines while they were unprepared. The German plan had been delayed, causing further problems for their submarines, which had reached the limit of their endurance at sea. On the afternoon of 31 May, Beatty encountered Hipper's battlecruiser force long before the Germans had expected. In a running battle, Hipper successfully drew the British vanguard into the path of the high seas fleet. By the time Beatty sighted the larger force and turned back towards the British main fleet, he had lost two battle cruisers from a force of six battle cruisers and four powerful battleships though he had sped ahead of his battleships of 5th Battle Squadron earlier in the day, effectively losing them as an integral component for much of this opening action against the five ships commanded by Hipper. Beatty's withdrawal at the sight of the high seas fleet, which the British had not known were in the open sea, would reverse the course of the battle by drawing the German fleet in pursuit towards the British Grand Fleet. Between 1830, when the sun was lowering on the western horizon, backlighting the German forces, and nightfall at about 2030, the two fleets totaling 250 ships between them directly engaged twice. Fourteen British and eleven German ships sank, with a total of 9,823 casualties. After sunset, and throughout the night, Jellicoe manoeuvred to cut the Germans off from their base, hoping to continue the battle the next morning, but under the cover of darkness Scheer broke through the British light forces forming the rearguard of the Grand Fleet and returned to port, both sides claimed victory. The British lost more ships and twice as many sailors but succeeded in containing the German fleet. The British press criticised the Grand Fleet's failure to force a decisive outcome, while Scheer's plan of destroying a substantial portion of the British fleet also failed. The British strategy of denying Germany access to both the United Kingdom and the Atlantic did succeed, which was the British long-term goal. The Germans' fleet in being 
continued to pose a threat, requiring the British to keep their battleships concentrated in the North Sea, but the battle reinforced the German policy of avoiding all fleet-to-fleet -fleet contact. At the end of 1916, after further unsuccessful attempts to reduce the Royal Navy's numerical advantage, the German Navy accepted that its surface ships had been successfully contained, subsequently turning its efforts and resources to unrestricted submarine warfare and the destruction of Allied and neutral shipping, which—along with the Zimmermann telegram, by April 1917 triggered the United States of America's declaration of war on Germany. Subsequent reviews commissioned by the Royal Navy generated strong disagreement between supporters of Jellicoe and Beatty concerning the two admirals' performance in the battle. Debate over their performance and the significance of the battle continues to this day. Topic. Background and planning Topic. German planning With 16 dreadnought-type battleships, compared with the Royal Navy's 28, the German high seas fleet stood little chance of winning a head-to-head -head clash. The Germans therefore adopted a divide-and-conquer strategy. They would stage raids into the North Sea and bombard the English coast, with the aim of luring out small British squadrons and pickets, which could then be destroyed by superior forces or submarines. In January 1916, Admiral von Pohl, commander of the German fleet, fell ill. He was replaced by Scheer, who believed that the fleet had been used too defensively, had better ships and men than the British, and ought to take the war to them. According to Scheer, the German naval strategy should be to damage the English fleet by offensive raids against the naval forces engaged in watching and blockading the German Bight, as well as by mine laying on the British coast and submarine attack, whenever possible. After an equality of strength had been realised as a result of these operations, and all our forces had been made ready and concentrated, an attempt was to be made with our fleet to seek battle under circumstances unfavourable to the enemy. On 25 April 1916, a decision was made by the German Admiralty to halt indiscriminate attacks by submarine on merchant shipping. This followed protests from neutral countries, notably the United States, that their nationals had been the victims of attacks. Germany agreed that future attacks would only take place in accord with internationally agreed prize rules, which required an attacker to give a warning and allow the crews of vessels time to escape, and not to attack neutral vessels at all. Scheer believed that it would not be possible to continue attacks on these terms, which took away the advantage of secret approach by submarines and left them vulnerable to even relatively small guns on the target ships. Instead, he set about deploying the submarine fleet against military vessels. It was hoped that, following a successful German submarine attack, fast British escorts, such as destroyers, would be tied down by anti submarine operations. If the Germans could catch the British in the expected locations, good prospects were thought to exist of at least partially redressing the balance of forces between the fleets after the British sortied in response to the raiding attack force. The Royal Navy's centuries-old instincts for aggressive action could be exploited to draw its weakened units towards the main German fleet under Scheer. The hope was that Scheer would thus be able to ambush a section of the British fleet and destroy it. Submarine deployments 
A plan was devised to station submarines offshore from British naval bases, and then stage some action that would draw out the British ships to the waiting submarines. The battlecruiser SMS Saidlitz had been damaged in a previous engagement, but was due to be repaired by mid-May, so an operation was scheduled for 17 May 1916. At the start of May, difficulties with condensers were discovered on ships of the 3rd Battleship Squadron, so the operation was put back to 23 May. Ten submarines. U-24, U-32, U-43, U-44, U-C-47, U-51, U-52, U-63, U-66, and U-70 were given orders first to patrol in the Central North Sea between 17 and the 22nd of May, and then to take up waiting positions. U-43 and U-44 were stationed in the Pentland Firth, which the Grand Fleet was likely to cross leaving Scapa Flow, while the remainder proceeded to the Firth of Forth, awaiting battle cruisers departing Rosyth. Each boat had an allocated area, within which it could move around as necessary to avoid detection, but was instructed to keep within it. During the initial North Sea Patrol the boats were instructed to sail only north-south so that any enemy who chanced to encounter one would believe it was departing or returning from operations on the west coast which required them to pass around the north of Britain. Once at their final positions, the boats were under strict orders to avoid premature detection that might give away the operation. It was arranged that a coded signal would be transmitted to alert the submarines exactly when the operation commenced. Take into account the enemy's forces may be putting to sea. Additionally, UB-27 was sent out on 20 May with instructions to work its way into the Firth of Forth past May Island. U-46 was ordered to patrol the coast of Sunderland, which had been chosen for the diversionary attack, but because of engine problems it was unable to leave port and U-47 was diverted to this task. On 13 May, U-72 was sent to lay mines in the Firth of Forth. On the 23rd, U-74 departed to lay mines in the Moray Firth, and on the 24th, U-75 was dispatched similarly west of the Orkney Islands. UB-21 and UB-22 were sent to patrol the Humber, where incorrect reports had suggested the presence of British warships. U-22, U-46 and U-67 were positioned north of Terschelling to protect against intervention by British light forces stationed at Harwich. On the 22nd of May 1916, it was discovered that Saidlitz was still not watertight after repairs and would not now be ready until the 29th. The ambush submarines were now on station and experiencing difficulties of their own, visibility near the coast was frequently poor due to fog, and sea conditions were either so calm the slightest ripple, as from the periscope, could give away their position, or so rough as to make it very hard to keep the vessel at a steady depth. The British had become aware of unusual submarine activity, and had begun counter patrols that forced the submarines out of position. UB 27 passed Bell Rock on the night of 23 May on its way into the Firth of Forth as planned, but was halted by engine trouble. After repairs it continued to approach, following behind merchant vessels, and reached Largo Bay on 25 May. There the boat became entangled in nets that fouled one of the propellers, forcing it to abandon the operation and return home. U-74 was detected by four armed trawlers on 27 May and sunk 25 miles 22 nmi, 40 kilometers southeast of Peterhead. 
U-75 laid its mines off the Orkney Islands, which, although they played no part in the battle, were responsible later for sinking the cruiser Hampshire carrying Lord Kitchener head of the army on a mission to Russia on 5 June. U-72 was forced to abandon its mission without laying any mines when an oil leak meant it was leaving a visible surface trail astern. Topic. Zeppelins The Germans maintained a fleet of Zeppelins that they used for aerial reconnaissance and occasional bombing raids. The planned raid on Sunderland intended to use Zeppelins to watch out for the British fleet approaching from the north, which might otherwise surprise the raiders. By 28 May, strong north-easterly winds meant that it would not be possible to send out the Zeppelins, so the raid again had to be postponed. The submarines could only stay on station until 1 June before their supplies would be exhausted and they had to return, so a decision had to be made quickly about the raid. It was decided to use an alternative plan, abandoning the attack on Sunderland but instead sending a patrol of battle cruisers to the Skagerrak, where it was likely they would encounter merchant ships carrying British cargo and British cruiser patrols. It was felt this could be done without air support, because the action would now be much closer to Germany, relying instead on cruiser and torpedo boat patrols for reconnaissance. Orders for the alternative plan were issued on 28 May, although it was still hoped that last-minute improvements in the weather would allow the original plan to go ahead. The German fleet assembled in the Jade River and at Wilhelmshaven and was instructed to raise steam and be ready for action from midnight on the 28th of May by 1400 on the 30th of May. The wind was still too strong and the final decision was made to use the alternative plan. The coded signal, the 31st of May GG 2490 was transmitted to the ships of the fleet to inform them the Skagerrak attack would start on 31 May. The pre-arranged signal to the waiting submarines was transmitted throughout the day from the E-Dienst radio station at Brugge, and the U-boat tender Arcona anchored at Emden. Only two of the waiting submarines, U-66 and U-32, received the order. Topic. British response Unfortunately for the German plan, the British had obtained a copy of the main German codebook from the light cruiser SMS Magdeburg, which had been boarded by the Russian Navy after the ship ran aground in Russian territorial waters in 1914. German naval radio communications could therefore often be quickly deciphered, and the British Admiralty usually knew about German activities. The British Admiralty's Room 40 maintained direction finding and interception of German naval signals. It had intercepted and decrypted a German signal on 28 May that provided ample evidence that the German fleet was stirring in the North Sea." Further signals were intercepted, and although they were not decrypted it was clear that a major operation was likely. At 11 o'clock on 30 May, Jellico was warned that the German fleet seemed prepared to sail the following morning. By 1700, the Admiralty had intercepted the signal from Scheer. The 31st of May GG 2490 
making it clear something significant was imminent. Not knowing the Germans' objective, Jellico and his staff decided to position the fleet to head off any attempt by the Germans to enter the North Atlantic or the Baltic through the Skagerrak, by taking up a position off Norway where they could potentially cut off any German raid into the shipping lanes of the Atlantic or prevent the Germans from heading into the Baltic. A position further west was unnecessary, as that area of the North Sea could be patrolled by air using blimps and scouting aircraft. Consequently, Admiral Jellico led the 16 dreadnought battleships of the 1st and 4th Battle Squadrons of the Grand Fleet and three battle cruisers of the 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron eastwards out of Scapa Flow at 22:30 on the 30th of May. He was to meet the second battle squadron of eight dreadnought battleships commanded by Vice Admiral Martin Jerome coming from Cromarty. Hipper's raiding force did not leave the outer Jade Roads until 1 o'clock on 31 May, heading west of Heligoland Island following a cleared channel through the minefields, heading north at 16 knots 30 km per hour, 18 miles per hour. The main German fleet of 16 dreadnought battleships of 1st and 3rd Battle Squadrons left the Jade at 2.30, being joined off Heligoland at 4 o'clock by the six pre-dreadnoughts of the 2nd Battle Squadron coming from the Elbe River. Beatty's faster force of six ships of the 1st and 2nd Battlecruiser Squadrons plus the 5th Battle Squadron of four fast battleships left the Firth of Fourth on the next day. Jellico intended to rendezvous with him 90 miles 78 nmi, 140 km west of the mouth of the Skagerrak off the coast of Jutland and wait for the Germans to appear or for their intentions to become clear. The planned position would give him the widest range of responses to likely German moves. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Naval tactics in 1916. The principle of concentration of force was fundamental to the fleet tactics of this time as in earlier periods. Tactical doctrine called for a fleet approaching battle to be in a compact formation of parallel columns, allowing relatively easy maneuvering, and giving shortened sight lines within the formation, which simplified the passing of the signals necessary for command and control. A fleet formed in several short columns could change its heading faster than one formed in a single long column. Since most command signals were made with flags or signal lamps between ships, the flagship was usually placed at the head of the center column so that its signals might be more easily seen by the many ships of the formation. Wireless telegraphy was in use, though security radio direction finding, encryption, and the limitation of the radio sets made their extensive use more problematic. Command and control of such huge fleets remained difficult, thus, it might take a very long time for a signal from the flagship to be relayed to the entire formation. It was usually necessary for a signal to be confirmed by each ship before it could be relayed to other ships, and an order for a fleet movement would have to be received and acknowledged by every ship before it could be executed. In a large single column formation, a signal could take 10 minutes or more to be passed from one end of the line to the other, whereas in a formation of parallel columns, visibility across the diagonals was often better and always shorter than in a single long column, and the diagonals gave signal redundancy. Increasing the probability that a message would be quickly seen and correctly interpreted, however, before battle was joined the heavy units of the fleet would, if possible, deploy into a single column. To form the battle line in the correct orientation relative to the enemy, the commanding admiral had to know the enemy fleet's distance, bearing, heading, and speed. 
It was the task of the scouting forces, consisting primarily of battle cruisers and cruisers, to find the enemy and report this information in sufficient time, and, if possible, to deny the enemy's scouting forces the opportunity of obtaining the equivalent information. Ideally, the battle line would cross the intended path of the enemy column so that the maximum number of guns could be brought to bear, while the enemy could fire only with the forward guns of the leading ships, a maneuver known as crossing the T. Admiral Togo, commander of the Japanese battleship fleet, had achieved this against Admiral Zinovy Rozhistvensky's Russian battleships in 1905 at the Battle of Tsushima, with devastating results. Jellico achieved this twice in one hour against the high seas fleet at Jutland, but on both occasions, Scheer managed to turn away and disengage, thereby avoiding a decisive action. Topic. Ship design Within the existing technological limits, a trade-off had to be made between the weight and size of guns, the weight of armor protecting the ship, and the maximum speed. Battleships sacrificed speed for armor and heavy naval guns 11 in 280 mm or larger. British battle cruisers sacrificed weight of armor for greater speed, while their German counterparts were armed with lighter guns and heavier armor. These weight savings allowed them to escape danger or catch other ships. Generally, the larger guns mounted on British ships allowed an engagement at greater range. In theory, a lightly armored ship could stay out of range of a slower opponent while still scoring hits. The fast pace of development in the pre-war years meant that every few years, a new generation of ships rendered its predecessors obsolete. Thus, fairly young ships could still be obsolete compared to the newest ships, and fare badly in an engagement against them. Admiral John Fisher, responsible for reconstruction of the British fleet in the pre war period, favoured large guns, oil fuel, and speed. Admiral Tirpitz, responsible for the German fleet, favoured ship survivability and chose to sacrifice some gun size for improved armour. The German battlecruiser SMS Derfelinger had belt armor equivalent in thickness, though not as comprehensive, to the British battleship HMS Iron Duke, significantly better than on the British battlecruisers such as Tiger. German ships had better internal subdivision and had fewer doors and other weak points in their bulkheads, but with the disadvantage that space for crew was greatly reduced. As they were designed only for sorties in the North Sea they did not need to be as habitable as the British vessels and their crews could live in barracks ashore when in harbour. <laughs> <laughs> Order of battle Warships of the period were armed with guns firing projectiles of varying weights, bearing high explosive warheads. The sum total of weight of all the projectiles fired by all the ship's broadside guns is referred to as weight of broadside. At Jutland, the total of the British ship's weight of broadside was 332,360 pounds 150,760 kilograms, while the German fleet's total was 134,216 pounds 60,879 kilograms. This does not take into consideration the ability of some ships and their crews to fire more or less rapidly than others, which would increase or decrease amount of fire that one combatant was able to bring to bear on their opponent for any length of time. Jellico's Grand Fleet was split into two sections. The Dreadnought Battle Fleet, with which he sailed, formed the main force and was composed of 24 battleships and three battlecruisers. 
The battleships were formed into three squadrons of eight ships, further subdivided into divisions of four, each led by a flag officer. Accompanying them were eight armoured cruisers, classified by the Royal Navy since 1913 as cruisers, eight light cruisers, four scout cruisers, 51 destroyers, and one destroyer minelayer. The Grand Fleet sailed without three of its battleships, Emperor of India in refit at Invergordon, Queen Elizabeth dry docked at Rosyth and Dreadnought in refit at Devonport. The brand new Royal Sovereign was left behind, with only three weeks in service, her untrained crew was judged unready for battle. British reconnaissance was provided by the battlecruiser fleet under David Beatty, six battle cruisers, four fast Queen Elizabeth class battleships, 14 light cruisers, and 27 destroyers. Air scouting was provided by the attachment of the seaplane tender HMS Engadine, one of the first aircraft carriers in history to participate in a naval engagement. The German high seas fleet under Scheer was also split into a main force and a separate reconnaissance force. Scheer's main battle fleet was composed of 16 battleships and six pre-dreadnought battleships arranged in an identical manner to the British. With them were six light cruisers and 31 torpedo boats, the latter being roughly equivalent to a British destroyer. The German scouting force, commanded by Franz Hipper, consisted of five battle cruisers, five light cruisers and thirty torpedo boats. The Germans had no equivalent to Engadine and no heavier-than-air aircraft to operate with the fleet but had the Imperial German Naval Airship Service's force of rigid airships available to patrol the North Sea. All of the battleships and battle cruisers on both sides carried torpedoes of various sizes, as did the lighter craft. The British battleships carried three or four underwater torpedo tubes. The battle cruisers carried from 2 to 5. All were either 18 inch or 21 inch diameter. The German battleships carried 5 or 6 underwater torpedo tubes in three sizes from 18 to 21 inch, and the battle cruisers carried 4 or 5 tubes. The German battle fleet was hampered by the slow speed and relatively poor armament of the six pre dreadnoughts of two squadron, which limited maximum fleet speed to 18 knots, 33 kilometers per hour, 21 miles per hour, compared to maximum British fleet speed of 21 knots 39 km per hour, 24 miles per hour. On the British side, the eight armoured cruisers were deficient in both speed and armour protection. Both of these obsolete squadrons were notably vulnerable to attacks by more modern enemy ships. Battlecruiser action The route of the British battlecruiser fleet took it through the patrol sector allocated to U-32. After receiving the order to commence the operation, the U-boat moved to a position 80 miles 70 nmi, 130 km east of the Isle of May at dawn on 31 May. At 3.40, it sighted the cruisers HMS Galatea and Phaeton leaving the fourth at 18 knots 33 km per hour, 21 miles per hour. It launched one torpedo at the leading cruiser at a range of 1,000 yards 910 meters, but its periscope jammed up, giving away the position of the submarine as it maneuvered to fire a second. The lead cruiser turned away to dodge the torpedo, while the second turned towards the submarine, attempting to ram. U-32 crash dived, and on raising its periscope at 4.10 saw two battle cruisers the second battlecruiser squadron heading southeast. 
They were too far away to attack, but Kapitänleutnant von Spiegel reported the sighting of two battleships and two cruisers to Germany. U-66 was also supposed to be patrolling off the Firth of Forth, but had been forced north to a position 60 miles (52 nmi, 97 kilometers) off Peterhead by patrolling British vessels. This now brought it into contact with the second battle squadron, coming from the Moray Firth. At 5 o'clock, it had to crash dive when the cruiser Duke of Edinburgh appeared from the mist heading toward it. It was followed by another cruiser, Boudicca, and eight battleships. U-66 got within 350 yards 320 meters of the battleships preparing to fire, but was forced to dive by an approaching destroyer and missed the opportunity. At 6.35, it reported eight battleships and cruisers heading north. The courses reported by both submarines were incorrect, because they reflected one leg of a zigzag being used by British ships to avoid submarines. Taken with a wireless intercept of more ships leaving Scapa Flow earlier in the night, they created the impression in the German high command that the British fleet, whatever it was doing, was split into separate sections moving apart, which was precisely as the Germans wished to meet it. Jellicoe's ships proceeded to their rendezvous undamaged and undiscovered. However, he was now misled by an Admiralty intelligence report advising that the German main battle fleet was still in port. The Director of Operations Division, Rear Admiral Thomas Jackson, had asked the Intelligence Division, Room 40, for the current location of German call sign DK, used by Admiral Scheer. They had replied that it was currently transmitting from Wilhelmshaven. It was known to the intelligence staff that Scheer deliberately used a different call sign when at sea, but no one asked for this information or explained the reason behind the query. To locate the German fleet, the German battle cruisers cleared the minefields surrounding the Amram swept channel by 9 o'clock. They then proceeded northwest, passing 35 miles 30 nmi, 56 km west of the Horns Reef lightship heading for the Little Fisher Bank at the mouth of the Skagerrak. The high seas fleet followed some 50 miles 43 nmi, 80 km behind. The battle cruisers were in line ahead, with the four cruisers of the two scouting group plus supporting torpedo boats ranged in an arc 8 miles 7.0 nmi, 13 km ahead and to either side. The X torpedo boat flotilla formed close support immediately surrounding the battle cruisers. The high seas fleet similarly adopted a line ahead formation, with close screening by torpedo boats to either side and a further screen of five cruisers surrounding the column 5 to 8 miles 4.3 to 7.0 nmi, 8.0 to 12.9 km away. The wind had finally moderated so that zeppelins could be used, and by 11.35 had been sent out, L-14 to the Skagerrak, L-23 240 miles 210 nmi, 390 km east of Nos Head in the Pentland Firth, L-21 120 miles 100 nmi, 190 km off Peterhead, L-9 100 miles 87 NMI 160 kilometers off Sunderland and L1680 miles 70 NMI 130 kilometers east of Flamborough Head Visibility however was still bad with clouds down to 1000 feet 300 meters Topic Contact By around 1400, Beatty's ships were proceeding eastward at roughly the same latitude as Hipper's squadron, which was heading north. 
Had the courses remained unchanged, Beatty would have passed between the two German fleets, 40 miles 35 nmi, 64 km south of the battle cruisers and 20 miles 17 nmi, 32 km north of the high seas fleet at around 1630, possibly trapping his ships just as the German plan envisioned. His orders were to stop his scouting patrol when he reached a point 260 miles 230 nmi, 420 km east of Britain and then turn north to meet Jellicoe, which he did at this time. Beatty's ships were divided into three columns, with the two battlecruiser squadrons leading in parallel lines 3 miles 2.6 nmi, 4.8 km apart. The 5th Battle Squadron was stationed 5 miles 4.3 nmi, 8.0 km to the northwest, on the side furthest away from any expected enemy contact, while a screen of cruisers and destroyers was spread southeast of the battle cruisers. After the turn, the 5th Battle Squadron was now leading the British ships in the westernmost column, and Beatty's squadron was centre and rearmost, with the 2nd BCS to the west. At 14.20 on 31 May, despite heavy haze and scuds of fog giving poor visibility, scouts from Beatty's force reported enemy ships to the southeast. The British light units, investigating a neutral Danish steamer NJ Fjord, which was stopped between the two fleets, had found two German destroyers engaged on the same mission B109 and B110. The first shots of the battle were fired at 1428 when HMS Galatea and Phaeton of the British 1st Light Cruiser Squadron opened on the German torpedo boats, which withdrew toward their approaching light cruisers. At 1436, the Germans scored the first hit of the battle when SMS Elbing, of Rear Admiral Friedrich Bodicker's scouting group 2, hit her British counterpart Galatea at extreme range. Beatty began to move his battle cruisers and supporting forces south eastwards and then east to cut the German ships off from their base and ordered Engadine to launch a seaplane to try to get more information about the size and location of the German forces. This was the first time in history that a carrier-based aeroplane was used for reconnaissance in naval combat. Engadine's aircraft did locate and report some German light cruisers just before 1530 and came under anti-aircraft gunfire but attempts to relay reports from the aeroplane failed. Unfortunately for Beatty, his initial course changes at 1432 were not received by Sir Hugh Evan Thomas's 5th Battle Squadron the distance being too great to read his flags, because the battlecruiser HMS Tiger the last ship in his column was no longer in a position where she could relay signals by searchlight to Evan Thomas, as she had previously been ordered to do. Whereas before the north turn, Tiger had been the closest ship to Evan Thomas, she was now further away than Beatty and Lyon. Matters were aggravated because Evan Thomas had not been briefed regarding standing orders within Beatty's squadron, as his squadron normally operated with the Grand Fleet. Fleet ships were expected to obey movement orders precisely and not deviate from them. Beatty's standing instructions expected his officers to use their initiative and keep station with the flagship. As a result, the four Queen Elizabeth class battleships which were the fastest and most heavily armed in the world at that time remained on the previous course for several minutes, ending up 10 miles 8.7 nmi, 16 kilometers behind rather than 5. Beatty also had the opportunity during the previous hours to concentrate his forces, and no reason not to do so, whereas he steamed ahead at full speed, faster than the battleships could manage. 
dividing the force had serious consequences for the British, costing them what would have been an overwhelming advantage in ships and firepower during the first half hour of the coming battle. With visibility favoring the Germans, Hipper's battle cruisers at 1522, steaming approximately northwest, sighted Beatty's squadron at a range of about 15 miles (13 nmi, 24 kilometers), while Beatty's forces did not identify Hipper's battle cruisers until 1530. Position 1 on map. At 1545, Hipper turned southeast to lead Beatty toward Shear, who was 46 miles 40 nmi, 74 km southeast with the main force of the High Seas Fleet. Topic. Run to the south Beatty's conduct during the next 15 minutes has received a great deal of criticism, as his ships outranged and outnumbered the German squadron, yet he held his fire for over 10 minutes with the German ships in range. He also failed to use the time available to rearrange his battle cruisers into a fighting formation, with the result that they were still maneuvering when the battle started. At 1548, with the opposing forces roughly parallel at 15,000 yards, 14,000 meters, with the British to the southwest of the Germans, i.e., on the right side, Hipper opened fire followed by the British ships as their guns came to bear upon targets position two. Thus began the opening phase of the battlecruiser action, known as the run to the south, in which the British chased the Germans, and Hipper intentionally led Beatty toward Shear. During the first minutes of the ensuing battle, all the British ships except Princess Royal fired far over their German opponents, due to adverse visibility conditions, before finally getting the range. Only Lion and Princess Royal had settled into formation, so the other four ships were hampered in aiming by their own turning. Beatty was to windward of Hipper, and therefore funnel and gun smoke from his own ships tended to obscure his targets, while Hipper's smoke blew clear. Also, the eastern sky was overcast and the grey German ships were indistinct and difficult to range. Beatty had ordered his ships to engage in a line, one British ship engaging with one German and his flagship HMS Lion doubling on the German flagship SMS Lutzo. However, due to another mistake with signalling by flag, and possibly because Queen Mary and Tiger were unable to see the German lead ship because of smoke, the second German ship, Derfelinger, was left unengaged and free to fire without disruption. SMS Moltke drew fire from two of Beatty's battle cruisers, but still fired with great accuracy during this time, hitting Tiger nine times in the first 12 minutes. The Germans drew first blood. Aided by superior visibility, Hipper's five battle cruisers quickly registered hits on three of the six British battle cruisers. Seven minutes passed before the British managed to score their first hit. The first near kill of the run to the south occurred at 1600, when a 30.5 cm shell from Lutzo wrecked the Q turret amidships on Beatty's flagship Lion. Dozens of crewmen were instantly killed, but far larger destruction was averted when the mortally wounded turret commander, Major Francis Harvey of the Royal Marines, promptly ordered the magazine doors shut and the magazine flooded. This prevented a magazine explosion at 1628, when a flash fire ignited ready cordite charges beneath the turret and killed everyone in the chambers outside. Q. Magazine. Lion was saved. HMS Indefatigable was not so lucky. At 1602, just 14 minutes into the gunnery exchange, she was hit aft by three 28 cm shells from SMS von der Tan, causing damage sufficient to knock her out of line and detonating. X. 
magazine aft. Soon after, despite the near maximum range, von der Tann put another 28 cm 11 in shell on Indefatigable's A turret forward. The plunging shells probably pierced the thin upper armor, and seconds later Indefatigable was ripped apart by another magazine explosion, sinking immediately with her crew of 1,019 officers and men, leaving only two survivors. Position 3 Hipper's position deteriorated somewhat by 1615 as the 5th Battle Squadron finally came into range, so that he had to contend with gunfire from the four battleships astern as well as Beatty's five remaining battle cruisers to starboard. But he knew his baiting mission was close to completion, as his force was rapidly closing with Shear's main body. At 1608, the lead battleship of the 5th Battle Squadron, HMS Barham, caught up with Hipper and opened fire at extreme range, scoring a 15 in 380 mm hit on von der Tann within 60 seconds. Still, it was 1615 before all the battleships of the 5th were able to fully engage at long range. At 1625, the battlecruiser action intensified again when HMS Queen Mary was hit by what may have been a combined salvo from Derfelinger and Saidlitz. She disintegrated when both forward magazines exploded, sinking with all but nine of her 1,275 man crew lost. Lost. Position 4. Commander von Hayes, the first gunnery officer aboard Derfelingler, noted, The enemy was shooting superbly. Twice the Derfelinger came under their infernal hail and each time she was hit. But the Queen Mary was having a bad time, engaged by the Saidlitz as well as the Derfelinger, she met her doom at 1626. A vivid red flame shot up from her forepart, then came an explosion forward, followed by a much heavier explosion amidships. Immediately afterwards, she blew up with a terrific explosion, the masts collapsing inwards and the smoke hiding everything. During the run to the south, from 1548 to 1654, the German battle cruisers made an estimated total of 42.28 and 30.5 cm hits on the British battle cruisers 9 on Lion, 6 on Princess Royal, 7 on Queen Mary, 14 on Tiger, 1 on New Zealand, 5 on Indefatigable, and 2 more on the battleship Barham, compared with only 1113.5 in 340 mm hits by the British battle cruisers 4 on Lutzo, 4 on Saidlitz, 2 on Moltke, 1 on von der Tann, and 6 15 in 380 mm hits by the battleships 1 on Saidlitz, 4 on Moltke, 1 on von der Tann. Shortly after 1626, a salvo struck on or around HMS Princess Royal, which was obscured by spray and smoke from shell bursts. A signalman promptly leapt into the Bridge of Lyon and announced, "'Princess Royal's blown up, sir!' Beatty famously turned to his flag captain, saying, "'Chatfield, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today.' In popular legend, Beatty also immediately ordered his ships to turn two points to port", i.e., two points nearer the enemy, but there is no official record of any such command or course change. Princess Royal, as it turned out, was still afloat after the spray cleared. At 1630, Shear's leading battleships sighted the distant battlecruiser action. Soon after, HMS Southampton of Beatty's second light cruiser squadron, led by Commodore William Goodenough, sighted the main body of Shear's high seas fleet, dodging numerous heavy caliber salvos to report in detail the German strength 16 dreadnoughts with six older battleships. This was the first news that Beatty and Jellicoe had that Shear and his battle fleet were even at sea. 
Simultaneously, an all-out destroyer action raged in the space between the opposing battlecruiser forces, as British and German destroyers fought with each other and attempted to torpedo the larger enemy ships. Each side fired many torpedoes, but both battlecruiser forces turned away from the attacks and all escaped harm except Sadlitz, which was hit forward at 1657 by a torpedo fired by the British destroyer HMS Petard. Though taking on water, Sadlitz maintained speed. The destroyer HMS Nestor, under the command of Captain Barry Bingham, led the British attacks. The British disabled the German torpedo boat V-27, which the Germans soon abandoned and sank, and Petard then torpedoed and sank V-29, her second score of the day. S-35 and V-26 rescued the crews of their sunken sister ships. But Nestor and another British destroyer, HMS Nomad, were immobilised by shell hits, and were later sunk by Shears passing dreadnoughts. Bingham was rescued, and awarded the Victoria Cross for his leadership in the destroyer action. <laughs> Run to the north As soon as he himself sighted the vanguard of Shear's distant battleship line 12 miles 10 nmi, 19 km away, at 1640, Beatty turned his battlecruiser force 180 degrees, heading north to draw the Germans toward Jellico. Position 5. Beatty's withdrawal toward Jellico is called the run to the north in which the tables turned and the Germans chased the British. Because Beatty once again failed to signal his intentions adequately, the battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron, which were too far behind to read his flags, found themselves passing the battle cruisers on an opposing course and heading directly toward the approaching main body of the High Seas Fleet. At 1648, at extreme range, Shears' leading battleships opened fire. Meanwhile, at 1647, having received Goodenough's signal and knowing that Beatty was now leading the German battle fleet north to him, Jellico signaled to his own forces that the fleet action they had waited so long for was finally imminent. At 1651, by radio, he informed the Admiralty so in London, the difficulties of the 5th Battle Squadron were compounded when Beatty gave the order to Evan Thomas to «turn in succession» rather than «turn together» at 1648 as the battleships passed him. Evan Thomas acknowledged the signal, but Lieutenant Commander Ralph Seymour, Beatty's flag lieutenant, aggravated the situation when he did not haul down the flags to execute the signal for some minutes. At 1655, when the 5 BS had moved within range of the enemy battleships, Evan Thomas issued his own flag command warning his squadron to expect sudden maneuvers and to follow his lead, before starting to turn on his own initiative. The order to turn in succession would have resulted in all four ships turning in the same patch of sea as they reached it one by one, giving the high seas fleet repeated opportunity with ample time to find the proper range. However, the captain of the trailing ship HMS Malaya turned early, mitigating the adverse results. For the next hour, the 5th Battle Squadron acted as Beatty's rearguard, drawing fire from all the German ships within range, while by 1710 Beatty had deliberately eased his own squadron out of range of Hipper's now superior battlecruiser force. Since visibility and firepower now favoured the Germans, there was no incentive for Beatty to risk further battlecruiser losses when his own gunnery could not be effective. Illustrating the imbalance, Beatty's battlecruisers did not score any hits on the Germans in this phase until 1745, but they had rapidly received five more before he opened the range four on Lyon, of which three were by Lutzow, and one on Tiger by Sadlitz. 
Now the only targets the Germans could reach, the ships of the 5th Battle Squadron, received simultaneous fire from Hipper's battle cruisers to the east which HMS Barham and Valiant engaged and Shear's leading battleships to the southeast which HMS Warspite and Malaya engaged. Three took hits, Barham four by Derfelinger, Warspite two by Sadlitz, and Malaya seven by the German battleships. Only Valiant was unscathed, the four battleships were far better suited to take this sort of pounding than the battle cruisers, and none were lost, though Malaya suffered heavy damage, an ammunition fire, and heavy crew casualties. At the same time, the 15 in 380 mm fire of the four British ships was accurate and effective. As the two British squadrons headed north at top speed, eagerly chased by the entire German fleet, the 5th Battle Squadron scored 13 hits on the enemy battle cruisers four on Lutzo, three on Derfelinger, six on Seidlitz, and five on battleships although only one, on SMS Markgriff, did any serious damage. Position 6 Topic. The fleets converge Jellicoe was now aware that full fleet engagement was nearing, but had insufficient information on the position and course of the Germans. To assist Beatty, early in the battle at about 1605, Jellicoe had ordered Rear Admiral Horace Hood's 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron to speed ahead to find and support Beatty's force, and Hood was now racing SSE well in advance of Jellicoe's northern force. Rear Admiral Arbuthnot's 1st Cruiser Squadron patrolled the van of Jellicoe's main battleship force as it advanced steadily to the southeast. At 1733, the armoured cruiser HMS Black Prince of Arbuthnot's squadron, on the far southwest flank of Jellicoe's force, came within view of HMS Falmouth, which was about 5 miles 4.3 nmi, 8.0 km ahead of Beatty with the 3rd Light Cruiser Squadron, establishing the first visual link between the converging bodies of the Grand Fleet. At 1738, the scout cruiser HMS Chester, screening Hood's oncoming battle cruisers, was intercepted by the van of the German scouting forces under Rear Admiral Bodicker, heavily outnumbered by Bodicker's four light cruisers. Chester was pounded before being relieved by Hood's heavy units, which swung westward for that purpose. Hood's flagship HMS Invincible disabled the light cruiser SMS Wiesbaden shortly after 1756. Wiesbaden became a sitting target for most of the British fleet during the next hour, but remained afloat and fired some torpedoes at the passing enemy battleships from long range. Meanwhile, Bodicker's other ships turned toward Hipper and Shear in the mistaken belief that Hood was leading a larger force of British capital ships from the north and east. A chaotic destroyer action in mist and smoke ensued as German torpedo boats attempted to blunt the arrival of this new formation, but Hood's battle cruisers dodged all the torpedoes fired at them. In this action, after leading a torpedo counterattack, the British destroyer HMS Shark was disabled, but continued to return fire at numerous passing enemy ships for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> Fleet action Deployment In the meantime, Beatty and Evan Thomas had resumed their engagement with Hipper's battle cruisers, this time with the visual conditions to their advantage. With several of his ships damaged, Hipper turned back toward Shear at around 1800, just as Beatty's flagship Lion was finally sighted from Jellicoe's flagship Iron Duke. 
Jellico twice demanded the latest position of the German battlefleet from Beatty, who could not see the German battleships and failed to respond to the question until 1814. Meanwhile, Jellico received confused sighting reports of varying accuracy and limited usefulness from light cruisers and battleships on the starboard southern flank of his force. Jellico was in a worrying position. He needed to know the location of the German fleet to judge when and how to deploy his battleships from their cruising formation, six columns of four ships each, into a single battle line. The deployment could be on either the westernmost or the easternmost column, and had to be carried out before the Germans arrived, but early deployment could mean losing any chance of a decisive encounter. Deploying to the west would bring his fleet closer to Scheer, gaining valuable time as dusk approached, but the Germans might arrive before the maneuver was complete. Deploying to the east would take the force away from Sheer, but Jellico's ships might be able to cross the T, and visibility would strongly favor British gunnery. Sheer's forces would be silhouetted against the setting sun to the west, while the Grand Fleet would be indistinct against the dark skies to the north and east, and would be hidden by reflection of the low sunlight off intervening haze and smoke. Deployment would take 20 irreplaceable minutes, and the fleets were closing at full speed. In one of the most critical and difficult tactical command decisions of the entire war, Jellico ordered deployment to the east at 1815. Topic. Windy Corner Meanwhile, Hipper had rejoined Shear, and the combined high seas fleet was heading north, directly toward Jellico. Shear had no indication that Jellico was at sea, let alone that he was bearing down from the northwest, and was distracted by the intervention of Hood's ships to his north and east. Beatty's four surviving battle cruisers were now crossing the van of the British dreadnoughts to join Hood's three battle cruisers. At this time, Arbuthnot's flagship, the armoured cruiser HMS Defence, and her squadron mate HMS Warrior both charged across Beatty's bows, and Lyon narrowly avoided a collision with Warrior. Nearby, numerous British light cruisers and destroyers on the southwestern flank of the deploying battleships were also crossing each other's courses in attempts to reach their proper stations, often barely escaping collisions, and under fire from some of the approaching German ships. This period of peril and heavy traffic attending the merger and deployment of the British forces later became known as Windy Corner. Arbuthnot was attracted by the drifting hull of the crippled Wiesbaden. With Warrior, defense closed in for the kill, only to blunder right into the gun sights of Hippers and Shears' oncoming capital ships. Defense was deluged by heavy caliber gunfire from many German battleships, which detonated her magazines in a spectacular explosion viewed by most of the deploying Grand Fleet. She sank with all hands 903 officers and men. Warrior was also hit badly, but was spared destruction by a mishap to the nearby battleship Warspite. Warspite had her steering gear overheat and jam under heavy load at high speed as the 5th Battle Squadron made a turn to the north at 1819. Steaming at top speed in wide circles, Warspite appeared as a juicy target to the German dreadnoughts and took 13 hits, inadvertently drawing fire from the hapless warrior. Warspite was brought back under control and survived the onslaught, but was badly damaged, had to reduce speed, and withdrew northward. Later, at 2107, she was ordered back to port by Evan Thomas. 
Warspite went on to a long and illustrious career, serving also in World War II. Warrior, on the other hand, was abandoned and sank the next day after her crew was taken off at 8:25 on the 1st of June by Engadine, which towed the sinking armored cruiser 100 miles (87 nmi, 160 kilometers) during the night. As defense sank and Warspite circled, at about 1819, Hipper moved within range of Hood's 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, but was still also within range of Beatty's ships. At first, visibility favored the British, HMS Indomitable hit Derfelinger three times and Sadlitz once, while Lutzo quickly took ten hits from Lyon, inflexible and invincible, including two below waterline hits forward by Invincible that would ultimately doom Hipper's flagship. But at 1830, Invincible abruptly appeared as a clear target before Lutzo and Derfelinger. The two German ships then fired three salvos each at Invincible, and sank her in 90 seconds. A 30.5 cm shell from the third salvo struck Invincible's Q turret amidships, detonating the magazines below and causing her to blow up and sink. All but six of her crew of 1,032 officers and men, including Rear Admiral Hood, were killed. Of the remaining British battle cruisers, only Princess Royal received heavy caliber hits at this time, 230.5 cm in by the battleship Markgriff. Lutzo, flooding forward and unable to communicate by radio, was now out of action and began to attempt to withdraw, therefore Hipper left his flagship and transferred to the torpedo boat SMSG-39, hoping to board one of the other battlecruisers later. Topic. Crossing the T By 1830, the main battle fleet action was joined for the first time, with Jellicoe effectively crossing Shears T. The officers on the lead German battleships, and Scheer himself, were taken completely by surprise when they emerged from drifting clouds of smoky mist to suddenly find themselves facing the massed firepower of the entire Grand Fleet main battle line, which they did not know was even at sea. Jellicoe's flagship Iron Duke quickly scored seven hits on the lead German dreadnought, SMS Konig but in this brief exchange, which lasted only minutes, as few as ten of the Grand Fleet's 24 dreadnoughts actually opened fire. The Germans were hampered by poor visibility, in addition to being in an unfavorable tactical position, just as Jellicoe had intended. Realizing he was heading into a death trap, Scheer ordered his fleet to turn and disengage at 1833. Under a pall of smoke and mist, Scheer's forces succeeded in disengaging by an expertly executed 180 degrees turn in unison. Battle about turn to starboard. German Gefechtkurtwendung nach Steuerbord, which was a well-practiced emergency maneuver of the High Seas Fleet. Scheer declared, It was now obvious that we were confronted by a large portion of the English fleet. The entire arc stretching from north to east was a sea of fire. The flash from the muzzles of the guns was seen distinctly through the mist and smoke on the horizon, although the ships themselves were not distinguishable. Conscious of the risks to his capital ships posed by torpedoes, Jellicoe did not chase directly but headed south, determined to keep the high seas fleet west of him. Starting at 1840, battleships at the rear of Jellicoe's line were in fact sighting and avoiding torpedoes, and at 1854 HMS Marlborough was hit by a torpedo, probably from the disabled Wiesbaden, which reduced her speed to 16 knots, 30 kilometers per hour, 18 miles per hour. 
Meanwhile, Shear, knowing that it was not yet dark enough to escape and that his fleet would suffer terribly in a stern chase, doubled back to the east at 1855. In his memoirs he wrote, "...the maneuver would be bound to surprise the enemy, to upset his plans for the rest of the day, and if the blow fell heavily it would facilitate the breaking loose at night." But the turn to the east took his ships, again, directly towards Jellicoe's fully deployed battle line. Simultaneously, the disabled British destroyer HMS Shark fought desperately against a group of four German torpedo boats and disabled V 48 with gunfire, but was eventually torpedoed and sunk at 1902 by the German destroyer S 54. Shark's captain Loftus Jones was awarded the Victoria Cross for his heroism in continuing to fight against all odds. Topic: Gefechtskurtwendung. Commodore Goodenough's second light cruiser squadron dodged the fire of German battleships for a second time to re-establish contact with the High Seas Fleet shortly after 1900. By 1915, Jellicoe had crossed Shears' T again. This time his arc of fire was tighter and deadlier, causing severe damage to the German battleships, particularly Rear Admiral Banke's leading 3rd Squadron SMS Koenig, Grosser Kurfürst, Markgraf, and Kaiser all being hit, along with SMS Helgoland of the 1st Squadron, while on the British side, only the battleship HMS Colossus was hit twice, by SMS Seydlitz but with little damage done, at 1917, for the second time in less than an hour, Scheer turned his outnumbered and outgunned fleet to the west using the ''Battle About Turn'' German, Gefechtkurtwendung, but this time it was executed only with difficulty, as the High Seas Fleet's lead squadrons began to lose formation under concentrated gunfire. To deter a British chase, Scheer ordered a major torpedo attack by his destroyers and a potentially sacrificial charge by scouting Group 1's four remaining battlecruisers. Hipper was still aboard the torpedo boat G-39 and was unable to command his squadron for this attack. Therefore, SMS Derfelinger, under Captain Hartig, led the already badly damaged German battlecruisers directly into the greatest concentration of naval gunfire any fleet commander had ever faced. At ranges down to 4 miles, 3.5 nmi, 6.4 kilometers, in what became known as the Death Ride. All the battle cruisers except SMS Moltke were hit and further damaged, as 18 of the British battleships fired at them simultaneously. Derfelinger had two main gun turrets destroyed. The crews of Scouting Group 1 suffered heavy casualties, but survived the pounding and veered away with the other battle cruisers once Scheer was out of trouble and the German destroyers were moving in to attack. In this brief but intense portion of the engagement, from about 1905 to about 1930, the Germans sustained a total of 37 heavy hits while inflicting only two. Derfelinger alone received 14, while his battle cruisers drew the fire of the British fleet. Sheer slipped away, laying smoke screens. Meanwhile, from about 1916 to about 1940, the British battleships were also engaging Shears torpedo boats, which executed several waves of torpedo attacks to cover his withdrawal. Jellicoe's ships turned away from the attacks and successfully evaded all 31 of the torpedoes launched at them, though, in several cases, only barely, and sank the German destroyer S-35, attributed to a salvo from Iron Duke. British light forces also sank V-48, which had previously been disabled by HMS Shark. 
This action, and the turn away, cost the British critical time and range in the last hour of daylight, as Shear intended, allowing him to get his heavy ships out of immediate danger. The last major exchanges between capital ships in this battle took place just after sunset, from about 2019 to about 2035, as the surviving British battlecruisers caught up with their German counterparts, which were briefly relieved by Rear Admiral Mauve's obsolete pre-dreadnoughts the German Second Squadron. The British received one heavy hit on Princess Royal but scored five more on Saedlitz and three on other German ships. As twilight faded to night and HMS King George V exchanged a few final shots with SMS Westfallen, neither side could have imagined that the only encounter between British and German dreadnoughts in the entire war was already concluded. Topic. Night action and German withdrawal At 2100, Jellicoe, conscious of the Grand Fleet's deficiencies in night fighting, decided to try to avoid a major engagement until early dawn. He placed a screen of cruisers and destroyers 5 miles 4.3 nmi, 8.0 km behind his battle fleet to patrol the rear as he headed south to guard Shear's expected escape route. In reality, Shear opted to cross Jellicoe's wake and escape via Horn's Reef. Luckily for Scheer, most of the light forces in Jellicoe's rearguard failed to report the seven separate encounters with the German fleet during the night. The very few radio reports that were sent to the British flagship were never received, possibly because the Germans were jamming British frequencies. Many of the destroyers failed to make the most of their opportunities to attack discovered ships, despite Jellicoe's expectations that the destroyer forces would, if necessary, be able to block the path of the German fleet. Jellicoe and his commanders did not understand that the furious gunfire and explosions to the north, seen and heard for hours by all the British battleships, indicated that the German heavy ships were breaking through the screen astern of the British fleet. Instead, it was believed that the fighting was the result of night attacks by German destroyers. The most powerful British ships of all the 15-inch guns of the 5th Battle Squadron directly observed German battleships crossing astern of them in action with British light forces, at ranges of 3 miles 2.6 nmi, 4.8 km or less, and gunners on HMS Malaya made ready to fire, but her captain declined, deferring to the authority of Rear Admiral Evan Thomas, and neither other commander reported the sightings to Jellicoe, assuming that he could see for himself and that revealing the fleet's position by radio signals or gunfire was unwise. While the nature of Scheer's escape, and Jellicoe's inaction, indicate the overall German superiority in night fighting, the results of the night action were no more clear-cut than were those of the battle as a whole. In the first of many surprise encounters by darkened ships at point-blank range, Southampton, Commodore Goodenough's flagship, which had scouted so proficiently, was heavily damaged in action with a German scouting group composed of light cruisers, but managed to torpedo SMS Frauenlob, which went down at 22:23 with all hands 320 officers and men. From 23.20 to approximately 2.15, several British destroyer flotillas launched torpedo attacks on the German battle fleet in a series of violent and chaotic engagements at extremely short range often under 0.5 miles 0.80 kilometers. 
At the cost of five destroyers sunk and some others damaged, they managed to torpedo the light cruiser SMS Rostock, which sank several hours later, and the pre-dreadnought SMS Pomern, which blew up and sank with all hands 839 officers and men at 310 during the last wave of attacks before dawn. Three of the British destroyers collided in the chaos, and the German battleship SMS Nassau rammed the British destroyer HMS Spitfire, blowing away most of the British ship's superstructure merely with the muzzle blast of its big guns, which could not be aimed low enough to hit the ship. Nassau was left with an 11 feet meters hole in her side, reducing her maximum speed to 15 knots 28 kilometers per hour, 17 miles per hour, while the removed plating was left lying on Spitfire's deck. Spitfire survived and made it back to port. Another German cruiser, SMS Elbing, was accidentally rammed by the dreadnought Posen and abandoned, sinking early the next day. Of the British destroyers, HMS Tipperary, Ardent, Fortune, Sparrowhawk and Turbulent were lost during the night fighting. Just after midnight on 1 June, SMS Thuringen and other German battleships sank HMS Black Prince of the ill-fated 1st Cruiser Squadron, which had blundered into the German battle line. Deployed as part of a screening force several miles ahead of the main force of the Grand Fleet, Black Prince had lost contact in the darkness and took a position near what she thought was the British line. The Germans soon identified the new addition to their line and opened fire. Overwhelmed by point-blank gunfire, Black Prince blew up, all hands 857 officers and men, were lost, as her squadron leader defense had done hours earlier. Lost in the darkness, the battlecruisers SMS Moltke and Saedlitz had similar point-blank encounters with the British battle line and were recognised, but were spared the fate of Black Prince when the captains of the British ships, again, declined to open fire, reluctant to reveal their fleet's position. At 1.45, the sinking battlecruiser Lutzo, fatally damaged by Invincible during the main action, was torpedoed by the destroyer G-38 on orders of Lutzo's captain Victor von Harder after the surviving crew of 1,150 transferred to destroyers that came alongside. At 2.15, the German torpedo boat V-4 suddenly had its bow blown off, V-2 and V-6 came alongside and took off the remaining crew, and the V-2 then sank the Hulk. Since there was no enemy nearby, it was assumed that she had hit a mine or had been torpedoed by a submarine. At 2.15, five British ships of the 13th destroyer flotilla under Captain James Uchtard Furry regrouped and headed south. At 2.25, they sighted the rear of the German line. HMS Marksman inquired of the leader champion as to whether he thought they were British or German ships. Answering that he thought they were German, Fury then veered off to the east and away from the German line. All but Moresby in the rear followed, as through the gloom she sighted what she thought were four pre-dreadnought battleships two miles nmi, kilometers away. She hoisted a flag signal indicating that the enemy was to the west and then closed to firing range, letting off a torpedo set for high running at 2.37, then veering off to rejoin her flotilla. The four pre-dreadnought battleships were in fact two pre-dreadnoughts, Schleswig-Holstein and Schlesen, and the battlecruisers von der Tann and Derfelinger. Von der Tann sighted the torpedo and was forced to steer sharply to starboard to avoid it as it passed close to her bows. 
Moresby rejoined champion convinced she had scored a hit. Finally, at 5.20, as Shear's fleet was safely on its way home, the battleship SMS Ostfriesland struck a British mine on her starboard side, killing one man and wounding ten, but was able to make port. Sadlitz, critically damaged and very nearly sinking, barely survived the return voyage. After grounding and taking on even more water on the evening of 1 June, she had to be assisted stern first into port, where she dropped anchor at 7 30 on the morning of 2 June. The Germans were helped in their escape by the failure of the British Admiralty in London to pass on seven critical radio intercepts obtained by naval intelligence indicating the true position, course and intentions of the high seas fleet during the night. One message was transmitted to Jellico at 23.15 that accurately reported the German fleet's course and speed as of 21.14. However, the erroneous signal from earlier in the day that reported the German fleet still in port, and an intelligence signal received at 2245 giving another unlikely position for the German fleet, had reduced his confidence in intelligence reports. Had the other messages been forwarded, which confirmed the information received at 2315, or had British ships reported accurately sightings and engagements with German destroyers, cruisers and battleships, then Jellico could have altered course to intercept Shear at the Horns Reef. The unsent intercepted messages had been duly filed by the junior officer left on duty that night, who failed to appreciate their significance. By the time Jellico finally learned of Scheer's whereabouts at 4.15, the German fleet was too far away to catch and it was clear that the battle could no longer be resumed. Topic. Outcome Topic. Reporting At midday on 2 June, German authorities released a press statement claiming a victory, including the destruction of a battleship, two battle cruisers, two armoured cruisers, a light cruiser, a submarine and several destroyers, for the loss of Pommern and Wiesbaden. News that Lutzo, Elbing and Rostock had been scuttled was withheld, on the grounds this information would not be known to the enemy. The victory of the Skagerrak was celebrated in the press, children were given a holiday and the nation celebrated. The Kaiser announced a new chapter in world history. Post-war, the official German history hailed the battle as a victory and it continued to be celebrated until after World War II. In Britain, the first official news came from German wireless broadcasts. Ships began to arrive in port, their crews sending messages to friends and relatives both of their survival and the loss of some 6,000 others. The authorities considered suppressing the news, but it had already spread widely. Some crews coming ashore found rumors had already reported them dead to relatives, while others were jeered for the defeat they had suffered. At 1900 on 2 June, the Admiralty released a statement based on information from Jellico containing the bare news of losses on each side. The following day British newspapers reported a German victory. The Daily Mirror described the German director of the Naval Department telling the Reichstag. The result of the fighting is a significant success for our forces against a much stronger adversary." The British population was shocked that the long-anticipated battle had been a victory for Germany. On 3 June, the Admiralty issued a further statement expanding on German losses, and another the following day with exaggerated claims. However, on 7 June the German admission of the losses of Lutzo and Rostock started to redress the sense of the battle as a loss. 
international perception of the battle began to change towards a qualified British victory, the German attempt to change the balance of power in the North Sea having been repulsed. In July, bad news from the Somme campaign swept concern over Jutland from the British consciousness. Topic. Assessments At Jutland, the Germans, with a 99-strong fleet, sank 115,000 long tons t of British ships, while a 151-strong British fleet sank 62,000 long tons t of German ships. The British lost 6,094 seamen, the Germans 2,551. Several other ships were badly damaged, such as Lyon and Saidlitz. As of the summer of 1916, the High Seas Fleet's strategy was to whittle away the numerical advantage of the Royal Navy by bringing its full strength to bear against isolated squadrons of enemy capital ships whilst declining to be drawn into a general fleet battle until it had achieved something resembling parity in heavy ships. In tactical terms, the High Seas Fleet had clearly inflicted significantly greater losses on the Grand Fleet than it had suffered itself at Jutland, and the Germans never had any intention of attempting to hold the site of the battle, so some historians support the German claim of victory at Jutland. However, Scheer seems to have quickly realized that further battles with a similar rate of attrition would exhaust the high seas fleet long before they reduced the Grand Fleet. Further, after the 19th of August advance was nearly intercepted by the Grand Fleet, he no longer believed that it would be possible to trap a single squadron of Royal Navy warships without having the Grand Fleet intervene before he could return to port. Therefore, the High Seas Fleet abandoned its forays into the North Sea and turned its attention to the Baltic for most of 1917 whilst Scheer switched tactics against Britain to unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic. At a strategic level, the outcome has been the subject of a huge amount of literature with no clear consensus. The battle was widely viewed as indecisive in the immediate aftermath, and this view remains influential. Despite numerical superiority, the British had been disappointed in their hopes for a decisive victory comparable to Trafalgar and the objective of the influential strategic doctrines of Alfred Mahon. The High Seas Fleet survived as a fleet in being. Most of its losses were made good within a month, even Saidlitz, the most badly damaged ship to survive the battle, was repaired by October and officially back in service by November. However, the Germans had failed in their objective of destroying a substantial portion of the British fleet, and no progress had been made towards the goal of allowing the High Seas Fleet to operate in the Atlantic Ocean. Subsequently, there has been considerable support for the view of Jutland as a strategic victory for the British. While the British had not destroyed the German fleet and had lost more ships than their enemy, the Germans had retreated to harbour, at the end of the battle the British were in command of the area. The German fleet would only sortie into the North Sea thrice more, with a raid on 19 August, one in October 1916 and another in April 1918. All three were unopposed by capital ships and quickly aborted as neither side was prepared to take the risks of mines and submarines. Apart from these three abortive operations the High Seas Fleet, unwilling to risk another encounter with the British fleet, confined its activities to the Baltic Sea for the remainder of the war. Jellicoe issued an order prohibiting the Grand Fleet from steaming south of the line of Horn's Reef owing to the threat of mines and U-boats. A German naval expert, writing publicly about Jutland in November 1918, commented, 
Our fleet losses were severe. On 1 June 1916, it was clear to every thinking person that this battle must, and would be, the last one. There is also significant support for viewing the battle as a German tactical victory, due to the much higher losses sustained by the British. The Germans declared a great victory immediately afterwards, while the British by contrast had only reported short and simple results. In response to public outrage, the First Lord of the Admiralty Arthur Balfour asked Winston Churchill to write a second report that was more positive and detailed. At the end of the battle, the British had maintained their numerical superiority and had 23 dreadnoughts ready and four battle cruisers still able to fight, while the Germans had only 10 dreadnoughts. One month after the battle, the Grand Fleet was stronger than it had been before sailing to Jutland. Warspite was dry docked at Rosyth, returning to the fleet on the 22nd of July, while Malaya was repaired in the floating dock at Invergordon, returning to duty on the 11th of July. Barham was docked for a month at Devonport before undergoing speed trials and returning to Scapa Flow on 8 July. Princess Royal stayed initially at Rosyth but transferred to dry dock at Portsmouth before returning to duty at Rosyth 21 July. Tiger was dry docked at Rosyth and ready for service 2 July. Queen Elizabeth, Emperor of India and HMAS Australia, which had been undergoing maintenance at the time of the battle, returned to the fleet immediately, followed shortly after by Resolution and Ramillies. Lion initially remained ready for sea duty despite the damaged turret, then underwent a month's repairs in July when Q turret was removed temporarily and replaced in September. A third view, presented in a number of recent evaluations, is that Jutland, the last major fleet action between battleships, illustrated the irrelevance of battleship fleets following the development of the submarine, mine, and torpedo. In this view, the most important consequence of Jutland was the decision of the Germans to engage in unrestricted submarine warfare. Although large numbers of battleships were constructed in the decades between the wars, it has been argued that this outcome reflected the social dominance among naval decision makers of battleship advocates who constrained technological choices to fit traditional paradigms of fleet action. Battleships played a relatively minor role in World War II, in which the submarine and aircraft carrier emerged as the dominant offensive weapons of naval warfare. <laughs> <laughs> British self-critique The official British Admiralty examination of the Grand Fleet's performance recognised two main problems. British armour-piercing shells exploded outside the German armour rather than penetrating and exploding within. As a result, some German ships with only 8 in 20 cm thick armour survived hits from 15-inch projectiles. Had these shells penetrated the armour and then exploded, German losses would probably have been far greater. Communication between ships and the British commander-in-chief were comparatively poor. For most of the battle, Jellico had no idea where the German ships were, even though British ships were in contact. They failed to report enemy positions, contrary to the Grand Fleet's battle plan. Some of the most important signalling was carried out solely by flag instead of wireless or using redundant methods to ensure communications. A questionable procedure, given the mixture of haze and smoke that obscured the battlefield, and a foreshadowing of similar failures by habit-bound and conservatively minded professional officers of rank to take advantage of new technology in World War II. Topic. 
Topic: <laughs> Shell performance. German armor-piercing shells were far more effective than the British ones, which often failed to penetrate heavy armor. The issue particularly concerned shells striking at oblique angles, which became increasingly the case at long range. Germany had adopted trinitrotoluene TNT as the explosive filler for artillery shells in 1902, while the United Kingdom was still using a picric acid mixture Lidite. The shock of impact of a shell against armor often prematurely detonated lidite in advance of fuse function while TNT detonation could be delayed until after the shell had penetrated and the fuse had functioned in the vulnerable area behind the armor plate. Some 17 British shells hit the side armor of the German dreadnoughts or battlecruisers. Of these, four would not have penetrated under any circumstances. Of the remaining 13, one penetrated the armor and exploded inside. This showed a 7.5% chance of proper shell function on the British side, a result of overly brittle shells and lidite exploding too soon. The issue of poorly performing shells had been known to Jellico, who as Third Sea Lord from 1908 to 1910 had ordered new shells to be designed. However, the matter had not been followed through after his posting to sea and new shells had never been thoroughly tested. Beatty discovered the problem at a party aboard Lyon a short time after the battle, when a Swedish naval officer was present. He had recently visited Berlin, where the German Navy had scoffed at how British shells had broken up on their ship's armour. The question of shell effectiveness had also been raised after the Battle of Dogger Bank, but no action had been taken. Hipper later commented, "...it was nothing but the poor quality of their bursting charges which saved us from disaster." Admiral Dreyer, writing later about the battle, during which he had been captain of the British flagship Iron Duke, estimated that effective shells as later introduced would have led to the sinking of six more German capital ships, based upon the actual number of hits achieved in the battle. The system of testing shells, which remained in use up to 1944, meant that, statistically, a batch of shells of which 70% were faulty stood an even chance of being accepted. Indeed, even shells that failed this relatively mild test had still been issued to ships. Analysis of the test results afterwards by the Ordnance Board suggested the likelihood that 30–70% of shells would not have passed the standard penetration test specified by the Admiralty. Efforts to replace the shells were initially resisted by the Admiralty, and action was not taken until Jellico became First Sea Lord in December 1916. As an initial response, the worst of the existing shells were withdrawn from ships in early 1917 and replaced from reserve supplies. New shells were designed, but did not arrive until April 1918, and were never used in action. <laughs> Battlecruiser losses British battlecruisers were designed to chase and destroy enemy cruisers from out of the range of those ships. They were not designed to be ships of the line and exchange broadsides with the enemy. One German and three British battlecruisers were sunk. But none were destroyed by enemy shells penetrating the belt armour and detonating the magazines. Each of the British battlecruisers was penetrated through a turret roof and her magazines ignited by flash fires passing through the turret and shell handling rooms. Lutzo sustained 24 hits and her flooding could not be contained. She was eventually sunk by her escort's torpedoes after most of her crew had been safely removed though six trapped stokers died when the ship was scuttled. 
Durflinger and Seidlitz sustained 22 hits each but reached port although in Seidlitz's case only just. The disturbing feature of the battlecruiser action is the fact that five German battle cruisers engaging six British vessels of this class, supported after the first 20 minutes, although at great range, by the fire of four battleships of the Queen Elizabeth class, were yet able to sink Queen Mary and indefatigable. The facts which contributed to the British losses, first, were the indifferent armour protection of our battle cruisers, particularly as regards turret armour, and, second, deck plating and the disadvantage under which our vessels laboured in regard to the light. Of this there can be no question. But it is also undoubted that the gunnery of the German battle cruisers in the early stages was of a very high standard. Jellicoe and Beatty, as well as other senior officers, gave an impression that the loss of the battle cruisers was caused by weak armor, despite reports by two committees and earlier statements by Jellicoe and other senior officers that Cordite and its management were to blame. This led to calls for armor to be increased, and an additional one in 2.5 cm was placed over the relatively thin decks above magazines. To compensate for the increase in weight, ships had to carry correspondingly less fuel, water and other supplies. Whether or not thin deck armor was a potential weakness of British ships, the battle provided no evidence that it was the case. At least amongst the surviving ships, no enemy shell was found to have penetrated deck armor anywhere. The design of the new battlecruiser HMS Hood which had started building at the time of the battle was altered to give her 5,000 long tons 5, of additional armor. Ammunition <inaudible> <inaudible> handling. <inaudible> British and German propellant charges differed in packaging, handling, and chemistry. The British propellant was of two types, MK1 and MD. The Mark I cordite had a formula of 37% nitrocellulose, 58% nitroglycerin, and 5% petroleum jelly. It was a good propellant but burned hot and caused an erosion problem in gun barrels. The petroleum jelly served as both a lubricant and a stabilizer. Cordite MD was developed to reduce barrel wear, its formula being 65% nitrocellulose, 30% nitroglycerin, and 5% petroleum jelly. While Cordite MD solved the gun barrel erosion issue, it did nothing to improve its storage properties, which were poor. Cordite was very sensitive to variations of temperature, and acid propagation – cordite deterioration would take place at a very rapid rate. Cordite MD also shed micro-dust particles of nitrocellulose and iron pyrite. While cordite propellant was manageable, it required a vigilant gunnery officer, strict cordite lot control, and frequent testing of the cordite lots in the ship's magazines. British cordite propellant, when uncased and exposed in the silk bag, tended to burn violently, causing uncontrollable flash fires when ignited by nearby shell hits. In 1945, a test was conducted by the USN Bureau of Ordnance Bulletin of Ordnance Information, number no. 245, pp. 54 to 60, testing the sensitivity of cordite to then current US naval propellant powders against a measurable and repeatable flash source. It found that cordite would ignite at 530 mm 22 from the flash, the current U.S. powder at 120 mm, 5, and the U.S. flashless powder at 25 mm, 1. 
This meant that about 75 times the propellant would immediately ignite when exposed to flash, as compared to the U.S. powder. British ships had inadequate protection against these flash fires. German propellant RPC-12, handled in brass cartridge cases was less vulnerable and less volatile in composition. German propellants were not that different in composition from cordite, with one major exception, centralite. This was symmetrical diethyl diphenyl urea, which served as a stabilizer that was superior to the petroleum jelly used in British practice. It stored better and burned but did not explode. Stored and used in brass cases, it proved much less sensitive to flash. RPC-12 was composed of 64.13% nitrocellulose, 29.77% nitroglycerin, 5.75% centralite, 0.25% magnesium oxide and 0.10% graphite. The Royal Navy battle cruiser fleet had also emphasized speed in ammunition handling over established safety protocol. In practice drills, cordite could not be supplied to the guns rapidly enough through the hoists and hatches. To bring up the propellant in good time to load for the next broadside, many safety doors were kept open that should have been shut to safeguard against flash fires. Bags of cordite were also stocked and kept locally, creating a total breakdown of safety design features. By staging charges in the chambers between the gun turret and magazine, the Royal Navy enhanced their rate of fire but left their ships vulnerable to chain reaction ammunition fires and magazine explosions. This bad safety habit carried over into real battle practices. Furthermore, the doctrine of a high rate of fire also led to the decision in 1913 to increase the supply of shells and cordite held on the British ships by 50%, for fear of running out of ammunition. When this exceeded the capacity of the ship's magazines, cordite was stored in insecure places. The British cordite charges were stored two silk bags to a metal cylindrical container, with a 16 Oz gunpowder igniter charge, which was covered with a thick paper wad, four charges being used on each projectile. The gun crews were removing the charges from their containers and removing the paper covering over the gunpowder igniter charges. The effect of having eight loads at the ready was to have four short tons 3, kilograms of exposed explosive, with each charge leaking small amounts of gunpowder from the igniter bags. In effect, the gun crews had laid an explosive train from the turret to the magazines, and one shell hit to a battlecruiser turret was enough to end a ship. A diving expedition during the summer of 2003 provided corroboration of this practice. It examined the wrecks of Invincible, Queen Mary, Defence, and Lutzo to investigate the cause of the British ship's tendency to suffer from internal explosions. From this evidence, a major part of the blame may be laid on lax handling of the cordite propellant for the shells of the main guns. The wreck of the Queen Mary revealed cordite containers stacked in the working chamber of the X turret instead of the magazine. There was a further difference in the propellant itself. While the German RPC-12 burned when exposed to fire, it did not explode, as opposed to cordite. RPC-12 was extensively studied by the British and, after World War I, would form the basis of the later Cordite SC. The memoirs of Alexander Grant, Gunner on Lion, suggest that some British officers were aware of the dangers of careless handling of cordite. With the introduction of cordite to replace powder for firing guns, regulations regarding the necessary precautions for handling explosives became unconsciously considerably relaxed, even I regret to say, to a dangerous degree throughout the service. 
The gradual lapse in the regulations on board ship seem to be due to two factors. First, cordite is a much safer explosive to handle than gunpowder. Second, but more important, the altered construction of the magazines on board led to a feeling of false security. The iron or steel deck, the disappearance of the wood lining, the electric lights fitted inside, the steel doors, opened because there was now no chute for passing cartridges out, all this gave officers and men a comparative easiness of mind regarding the precautions necessary with explosive material. Grant had already introduced measures onboard Lion to limit the number of cartridges kept outside the magazine and to ensure doors were kept closed, probably contributing to her survival. On the 5th of June 1916, the First Lord of the Admiralty advised cabinet members that the three battle cruisers had been lost due to unsafe cordite management. On the 22nd of November 1916, following detailed inter Interviews of the survivors of the destroyed battle cruisers, the Third Sea Lord, Rear Admiral Tudor, issued a report detailing the stacking of charges by the gun crews in the handling rooms to speed up loading of the guns. After the battle, the BCF Gunnery Committee issued a report at the command of Admiral David Beatty advocating immediate changes in flash protection and charge handling. It reported, among other things, that some vent plates in magazines allowed flash into the magazines and should be retro-fitted to a new standard. Bulkheads in HMS Lyons magazine showed buckling from fire under pressure, overpressure, despite being flooded and therefore supported by water pressure, and must be made stronger. Doors opening inward to magazines were an extreme danger. Current designs of turrets could not eliminate flash from shell bursts in the turret from reaching the handling rooms. Ignition pads must not be attached to charges but instead be placed just before ramming. Better methods must be found for safe storage of ready charges than the current method. Some method for rapidly drowning charges already in the handling path must be devised. Handling scuttles special flash proof fittings for moving propellant charges through ship's bulkheads, designed to handle overpressure, must be fitted. The United States Navy in 1939 had quantities of Cordite N, a Canadian propellant that was much improved, yet its Bureau of Ordnance objected strongly to its use on board U.S. warships, considering it unsuitable as a naval propellant due to its inclusion of nitrogen. Nitroglycerin. Topic gunnery British gunnery control systems, based on drier tables, were well in advance of the German ones, as demonstrated by the proportion of main caliber hits made on the German fleet. Because of its demonstrated advantages, it was installed on ships progressively as the war went on, had been fitted to a majority of British capital ships by May 1916, and had been installed on the main guns of all but two of the Grand Fleet's capital ships. The Royal Navy used centralized fire control systems on their capital ships, directed from a point high up on the ship where the fall of shells could best be seen, utilizing a director site for both training and elevating the guns. In contrast, the German battle cruisers controlled the fire of turrets using a training only director, which also did not fire the guns at once. The rest of the German capital ships were without even this innovation. German range finding equipment was generally superior to the British 9 feet (2.7 meters) FT24, as its operators were trained to a higher standard due to the complexity of the Zeiss 3 meters (9.8 feet) range finders. Their stereoscopic design meant that in certain conditions they could range on a target enshrouded by smoke. 
The German equipment was not superior in range to the British Bar and Stroud 15 feet (4.6 meters) rangefinder found in the newest British capital ships, and unlike the British rangefinders, the German range takers had to be replaced as often as every 30 minutes, as their eyesight became impaired, affecting the ranges provided to their gunnery equipment. The results of the battle confirmed the value of firing guns by centralized director. The battle prompted the Royal Navy to install director firing systems in cruisers and destroyers, where it had not thus far been used, and for secondary armament on battleships, German ships were considered to have been quicker in determining the correct range to targets, thus obtaining an early advantage. The British used a bracket system, whereby a salvo was fired at the best guess range and, depending where it landed, the range was progressively corrected up or down until successive shots were landing in front of and behind the enemy. The Germans used a ladder system, whereby an initial volley of three shots at different ranges was used, with the center shot at the best guess range. The latter system allowed the gunners to get ranging information from the three shots more quickly than the bracket system, which required waiting between shots to see how the last had landed. British ships adopted the German system, it was determined that 9-foot range finders of the sort issued to most British ships were not adequate at long range and did not perform as well as the 15-foot range finders on some of the most modern ships. In 1917, range finders of base lengths of 25 and 30 feet (7.6 and 9.1 meters) were introduced on the battleships to improve accuracy. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Signaling. Throughout the battle, British ships experienced difficulties with communications, whereas the Germans did not suffer such problems. The British preferred signalling using ship-to-ship -ship flag and lamp signals, avoiding wireless, whereas the Germans used wireless successfully. One conclusion drawn was that flag signals were not a satisfactory way to control the fleet. Experience using lamps, particularly at night when issuing challenges to other ships, demonstrated this was an excellent way to advertise your precise location to an enemy, inviting a reply by gunfire. Recognition signals by lamp, once seen, could also easily be copied in future engagements. British ships both failed to report engagements with the enemy but also, in the case of cruisers and destroyers, failed to actively seek out the enemy. A culture had arisen within the fleet of not acting without orders, which could prove fatal when any circumstances prevented orders being sent or received. Commanders failed to engage the enemy because they believed other, more senior officers must also be aware of the enemy nearby, and would have given orders to act if this was expected. Wireless, the most direct way to pass messages across the fleet although it was being jammed by German ships, was avoided either for perceived reasons of not giving away the presence of ships or for fear of cluttering up the airwaves with unnecessary reports. <laughs> fleet standing orders Naval operations were governed by standing orders issued to all the ships. These attempted to set out what ships should do in all circumstances, particularly in situations where ships would have to react without referring to higher authority, or when communications failed. A number of changes were introduced as a result of experience gained in the battle. A new signal was introduced instructing squadron commanders to act independently as they thought best while still supporting the main fleet, particularly for use when circumstances would make it difficult to send detailed orders. 
The description stressed that this was not intended to be the only time commanders might take independent action, but was intended to make plain times when they definitely should. Similarly, instructions on what to do if the fleet was instructed to take evasive action against torpedoes were amended. Commanders were given discretion that if their part of the fleet was not under immediate attack, they should continue engaging the enemy rather than turning away with the rest of the fleet. In this battle, when the fleet turned away from Shear's destroyer attack covering his retreat, not all the British ships had been affected, and could have continued to engage the enemy. A number of opportunities to attack enemy ships by torpedo had presented themselves but had been missed. All ships, not just the destroyers armed principally with torpedoes but also battleships, were reminded that they carried torpedoes intended to be used whenever an opportunity arose. Destroyers were instructed to close the enemy fleet to fire torpedoes as soon as engagements between the main ships on either side would keep enemy guns busy directed at larger targets. Destroyers should also be ready to immediately engage enemy destroyers if they should launch an attack, endeavoring to disrupt their chances of launching torpedoes and keep them away from the main fleet. To add some flexibility when deploying for attack, a new signal was provided for deploying the fleet to the center, rather than as previously only either to left or right of the standard closed up formation for traveling. The fast and powerful 5th Battle Squadron was moved to the front of the cruising formation so it would have the option of deploying left or right depending upon the enemy position. In the event of engagements at night, although the fleet still preferred to avoid night fighting, a destroyer and cruiser squadron would be specifically detailed to seek out the enemy and launch destroyer attacks. Topic. Controversy At the time, Jellico was criticized for his caution and for allowing Scheer to escape. Beatty, in particular, was convinced that Jellico had missed a tremendous opportunity to annihilate the high seas fleet and win what would amount to another Trafalgar. Jellico was promoted away from active command to become First Sea Lord, the professional head of the Royal Navy, while Beatty replaced him as commander of the Grand Fleet. The controversy raged within the Navy and in public for about a decade after the war. Criticism focused on Jellico's decision at 1915. Scheer had ordered his cruisers and destroyers forward in a torpedo attack to cover the turning away of his battleships. Jellico chose to turn to the southeast, and so keep out of range of the torpedoes. Supporters of Jellico, including the historian Cyril Falls, pointed to the folly of risking defeat in battle when one already has command of the sea. Jellico himself, in a letter to the Admiralty 17 months before the battle, said that he intended to turn his fleet away from any mass torpedo attack that being the universally accepted proper tactical response to such attacks, practiced by all the major navies of the world. He said that, in the event of a fleet engagement in which the enemy turned away, he would assume they intended to draw him over mines or submarines, and he would decline to be so drawn. The Admiralty approved this plan and expressed full confidence in Jellico at the time October 1914. The stakes were high, the pressure on Jellico immense, and his caution certainly understandable. His judgment might have been that even 90% odds in favour were not good enough to bet the British Empire. The former First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill said of the battle that Jellico was the only man on either side who could have lost the war in an afternoon. 
The criticism of Jellico also fails to sufficiently credit Shear, who was determined to preserve his fleet by avoiding the full British battle line, and who showed great skill in effecting his escape. Topic: <laughs> Beatty's actions. On the other hand, some of Jellicoe's supporters condemned the actions of Beatty for the British failure to achieve a complete victory. Although Beatty was undeniably brave, his mismanagement of the initial encounter with Hipper's squadron and the High Seas Fleet cost considerable advantage in the first hours of the battle. His most glaring failure was in not providing Jellicoe with periodic information on the position, course, and speed of the high seas fleet. Beatty, aboard the battlecruiser Lion, left behind the four fast battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron, the most powerful warships in the world at the time, engaging with six ships when better control would have given him ten against Hipper's five. Though Beatty's larger 13.5 in 340 mm guns outranged Hipper's 11 and 12 in 280 and 300 mm guns by thousands of yards, Beatty held his fire for 10 minutes and closed the German squadron until within range of the Germans' superior gunnery, under lighting conditions that favoured the Germans. Most of the British losses in tonnage occurred in Beatty's force. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Death toll. The total loss of life on both sides was 9823 personnel. The British losses numbered 6784 and the German 3039. Counted among the British losses were two members of the Royal Australian Navy and one member of the Royal Canadian Navy. Six Australian nationals serving in the Royal Navy were also killed. <laughs> British 113,300 tonnes sunk Battlecruisers Indefatigable, Queen Mary, Invincible Armoured Cruisers Black Prince, Warrior, Defence Flotilla Leader Tipperary Destroyers Shark, Sparrowhawk, Turbulent, Ardent, Fortune, Nomad, Nestor German 62,300 tons sunk Battlecruiser Lutzo Pre-Dreadnought Pomern Light cruisers Frauenlob, Elbing, Rostock, Wiesbaden Destroyers Heavy torpedo boats V-48, S-35, V-27, V-4, V-29 Topic. Selected honours The Victoria Cross is the highest military decoration awarded for valour, in the face of the enemy, to members of the British Empire Armed Forces. The Ordre pour le Merit was the Kingdom of Prussia and consequently the German Empire's highest military order until the end of the First World War. Topic. Pour le Merit Franz Hipper SMS Lutzo. Reinhard Scheer SMS Friedrich der Gross. Topic. Victoria Cross The Honorable. Edward Barry Stuart Bingham HMS Nestor. John Travers Cornwell, HMS Chester. Francis John William Harvey, HMS Lion. Loftus William Jones, HMS Shark. 
Topic: <laughs> Status of the survivors and wrecks. In the years following the battle, the wrecks were slowly discovered. Invincible was found by the Royal Navy minesweeper HMS Oakley in 1919. After the Second World War some of the wrecks seem to have been commercially salvaged. For instance, the hydrographic office record for SMS Lutzo number 32344 shows that salvage operations were taking place on the wreck in 1960. During 2000 to 2016, a series of diving and marine survey expeditions involving veteran shipwreck historian and archaeologist Innes McCartney has located all of the wrecks sunk in the battle. It was discovered that over 60% of them had suffered from metal theft. In 2003 McCartney led a detailed survey of the wrecks for the Channel 4 documentary, Clash of the Dreadnoughts. The film examined the last minutes of the lost ships and revealed for the first time how both P and Q turrets of Invincible had been blasted out of the ship and tossed into the sea before she broke in half. This was followed by the Channel 4 documentary, Jutland, WWI's Greatest Sea Battle. Broadcast in May 2016, which showed how several of the major losses at Jutland had actually occurred and just how accurate the Harper record actually was. On the 90th anniversary of the battle, in 2006, the UK Ministry of Defence belatedly announced that the 14 British vessels lost in the battle were being designated as protected places under the Protection of Military Remains Act 1986. This legislation only affects British ships and citizens and in practical terms offers no real protection from non-British salvers of the wreck sites. In May 2016 a number of British newspapers named the Dutch salvage company, Friendship Offshore. As one of the main salvers of the Jutland wrecks in recent years and depicted leaked photographs revealing the extent of their activities on the wreck of HMS Queen Mary, the last surviving veteran of the battle, Henry Allingham, a British RAF originally RNAS airman, died on 18 July 2009, aged 113, by which time he was the oldest documented man in the world and one of the last surviving veterans of the whole war. Also among the combatants was the then 20-year-old Prince Albert, serving as a junior officer aboard HMS Collingwood. He was second in the line to the throne, but would become king as George VI following his brother Edward's abdication in 1936. In 2013, one ship from the battle survives and is still afloat, the light cruiser HMS Caroline. Decommissioned in 2011, she is docked at the Royal Naval Reserve Depot in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Topic. Remembrance The Battle of Jutland was annually celebrated as a great victory by the right wing in Weimar Germany. This victory was used to repress the memory of the German Navy's initiation of the German Revolution of 1918–1919, as well as the memory of the defeat in World War I in general. The celebrations of the Battle of Tannenberg played a similar role. This is especially true for the city of Wilhelmshaven, where wreath-laying ceremonies and torch-lit parades were performed until the end of the 1960s. In 1916, Contradmiral Friedrich von Kuluiter (1865–1931) wrote a detailed analysis of the battle and published it in a book under the title "Skagerrak: 
first anonymously published, which was reprinted in large numbers until after World War II and had a huge influence in keeping the battle in public memory amongst Germans as it was not tainted by the ideology of the Third Reich. Kuluiter built the school for naval officers at Merwick near Flensburg, where he is still remembered. In May 2016, the 100th anniversary commemoration of the Battle of Jutland was held. On 29 May, a commemorative service was held at St. Mary's Church, Wimbledon, where the ensign from HMS Inflexible is on permanent display. On 31 May, the main service was held at St. Magnus Cathedral in Orkney, attended by the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, and the German President, Joachim Gauck, along with Princess Anne and Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence. Topic. Film Wrath of the Seas Die Versunkene Flot, 1926, Director Manfred Noah Topic. See also List of the largest artificial non-nuclear explosions Sea War Museum Jutland Topic Notes Topic Citations Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading Topic External Links WW One Centenary News, Battle of Jutland, Jutland Centenary Initiative, Jutland Commemoration Exhibition Interactive map of Jutland sailors Beatty's official report Jellicoe's official dispatch Jellicoe, extract from the Grand Fleet, published 1919 World War I naval combat, dispatches Scheer, Germany's high seas fleet in the World War, published 1920 Henry Allingham last known survivor of the Battle of Jutland Jutland casualties listed by ship http colon slash slash germanovelwarfare.info slash indexjute.htm Some original documents from the British Admiralty, Room 40, regarding the Battle of Jutland, photocopies from the National Archives, Q, Richmond, UK. Battle of Jutland Crew Lists Project Topic. Notable accounts By Rudyard Kipling retrieved 31 October 2009 By Alexander Grant, a gunner aboard HMS Lion a North Sea Diary, 1914–1918, by Stephen King Hall, a junior officer on the light cruiser HMS Southampton By Paul Berryman, a junior officer on HMS Malaya By Moritz von Egede, captain of SMS Seidlitz By Richard Forster, gunnery officer on Seidlitz by Georg von Hayes, gunnery officer on Derfelinger. Note: Due to the time difference, entries in some of the German accounts are one hour ahead of the times in this article. Closing parenthesis. <laughs>